Praise God. Thank you, Greg, and the ensemble. Appreciate the dedication of uh, singers that so give their time and their life to the work of God. Good morning. I trust that you can all hear me. <laughs> Just, you got enough, uh, got a speaker for everybody here today. This morning, I woke up early and began to pray. I said, God, I, I don't want to just bring the, you know, the tendency that we always have when we go to, especially speak to pastors, is you kind of bring the, the gems of revelation that God's given you. And, but it's not necessarily a living word. And uh, the Lord had been putting a thought in my heart. And I didn't fully, I couldn't fully grasp what he was getting at. And this morning when I got up, he just started unlocking it and opening it and said, this is, this is what I want you to speak today to the pastors that are gathered together. And uh, so, uh, and then this, after I, this session this morning, then uh, Pastor Teresa is going to be speaking in the second session and bringing us a word from the Lord. And then after that, then Pastor Neil Rhodes, one, another uh, one of the associate pastors at Times Square Church, is uh, going to be wrapping it all up after lunch today. Uh, one of the crowning achievements, I think, of the, the life and ministry of Pastor David Wilkerson is a, a book that he wrote. It's, it would be his uh, last book. It's called The New Covenant Unveiled. It's an unveiling of God's remedy to uh, defeat the power of sin in the last day church. A phenomenal book, a phenomenal series of messages, and uh, Pastor Neil will bringing, be bringing an encapsulated version of that uh, after lunch today. And uh, I do recommend, if you do get any book in this generation at all, uh, if you can go online to uh, Times Square Church or tscnyc.org and get a copy of the New Covenant Unveiled. It, it is... It is one of the most, prof it's simple, but you know, it's, it's the tendency of the Christian church that we can quite often lose the simplicity of Christ. Paul himself said, I, I fear that if, having started, you, you lose the simplicity that is ours in Christ. These are not, there's nothing new in it. It's not revelatory. It's just, it's truth that was known in the church it can be easily proven. Puritan writers knew it. They knew about the, under they understood the new covenant of God. And uh, Pastor David brings it out in a, in a modern context. Uh, for the church today. Very liberating, incredibly liberating. Simple, but very, very liberating. So I think you're going to be greatly blessed. If you, if you have your Bible with you this morning, I'm getting a lot of echo, Ivan. Is it possible? Maybe we're too loud. I think everybody can hear. Thank you. Uh, I want to, if you go to Genesis chapter 26, if, if I were to give this a title, I guess I would call it... Um, Redigging the Old Wells of Abraham, for lack of a better title. Genesis 26, I'd like to start reading at verse 15. Now, this is Isaac now, the son of Abraham, following in uh, the footsteps of his father. And he said, for all the wells which his father's servants had digged in the days of Abraham, his father, the Philistines had stopped them and filled them with earth. And Abimelech said unto Isaac, Abimelech being the king of the uh, Philistines, Go from us, for thou art mightier than we. And Isaac departed thence and pitched his tent in the valley of Gerar and dwelt there. And Isaac digged again the wells of water which they had digged in the days of Abraham his father. For the Philistines had stopped them after the death of Abraham. And he called their names after the names by which his father had called them. We're now at verse 19. And Isaac's servants digged in the valley and found there a well of springing water. And the herdmen of Gerar did strive with Isaac's herdmen, saying, The water is ours. And he called the name of the well Esek, because they strove with him. Then they digged another well and strove for that also, and he called the name of it Sitna. And he removed from thence and digged another well, and for that they strove not. And he called in the name of it Rehoboth, for he said, For now the Lord hath made room for us, and we shall be fruitful in the land. And he went up from thence to Beersheba. And the Lord appeared unto him the same night and said, I am the God of Abraham thy father. Fear not, for I am with thee, and I will bless thee, and I will multiply thy seed for my servant Abraham's sake. And he built an altar there and called upon the name of the Lord and pitched his tent there. And there Isaac's servants digged a well. Now, Father, I pray, God, Lord, for the anointing of the Holy Spirit, and God, where you are, there's life. Where you are, Jesus Christ, there's, there's strength, there's redemption, there's correction, and there's hope. 
And Lord, I'm asking for an anointing today, God, to bring out these simple truths in, a, in such a way, Lord, that they become very attractive to our hearts, something that we long for, something that we aspire to as a higher way of living than the way of the natural mind. Help us today, oh God, help me to speak this clearly. I thank you for it in Jesus' mighty and holy name. Amen. Now, now, Abraham had once dwelt in the same place where Isaac now found himself in our opening text. But the interesting thing is, after Abraham left, the Philistines filled in the walls that Abraham had dug with earth. Now, that's, that's a type of something. I don't know why they filled them in. In those days, water was life. You didn't have water, you didn't have life. You had no water, you had no livestock, you had no crops. It, it, was, it was essential to life. And you would think that if somebody had digged a well in, in your land and it was producing some kind of a springing, bubbling water that you'd want to keep that well. And I've, it's only conjecture on my part, but I, I think the Philistines saw uh, something so, because they, they told Isaac, they said, you are more and you're mightier than we are. They were afraid of Abraham. They were afraid of Abraham's descendants. And the powers of darkness are afraid of the church, and rightfully so, of Jesus Christ. And Abraham had a strength there was, there was this touch of God on his life. There, were, there was this progression of power, kingdom in Abraham, which they knew they didn't have. And most likely after Abraham's departure, maybe they went to the wells and they drank from it. And they said, and they didn't change. And because the natural men don't change. They can touch spiritual things and they don't change. You, it's only a spiritual man or woman that will touch something spiritual and actually change. The natural men don't change. They just get darker. They touch the things of God and the light in them becomes darkness. Jesus warned, said, if the light that is in you become darkness, how great is that darkness? Have you ever met a man or woman who studies, studies scripture for years and it's never touched their lives and how dark they've become? There's, there's no darker darkness than a religious darkness that can come on a heart that's not really given to the change that the word of God brings. And so the Philistines said, well, lest these people, that's only my theory, but I think it, it may have some validity. Lest these people come back and drink from this well again and become more than we are and overpower us, we've got to fill these wells because it really didn't make sense to fill a well in, in, in that or any other generation. And so Isaac comes back into the place where Abraham had once dwelt and now he has to redig those wells of Abraham. And it's a type in a sense of, of you and I having come to a, the place where all those who have served Christ before us um, they've, they've found something of God. Not, not, not everybody found it, but many did find it. They found a life, they found a strength, they found a power to be transformed themselves and to change their societies. They moved into something of supernatural life. And th this world and every power of darkness in it would do everything it can to fill these places. That we, we don't find our strength where those before us have found this supernatural strength of God. And it, it's in that context that I'm sharing this truth this morning. Now I just want to briefly go over it. I'm not going to read it all because I really don't have time. We've only got a, a 40 minute session uh, this morning, but let me just quickly go through what I've been reading again this morning. In Genesis 20, it tells us that in this place, that's Gerar, <clears throat> that Abraham prayed for good to come to a man and to his house who had unknowingly wronged him. Now it was in Gerar where Abraham's wife, Sarah, had been taken into Abimelech's harem. And because of this transgression that Abimelech had done against him, that he, he was not really even aware that he had done it, uh, Abimelech's, the wombs of his house were closed, and so there was, there was no chance that there could, they, they were actually doomed to be extinct in a sense, unless God lifted his hand off of them. And once this man was reproved by God, Abraham prayed for him, and Sarah was given back to Abraham out of Abimelech's harem. And uh, he, Abraham prayed for this man, and, he, and he, he prayed, and when he prayed for him, the wombs of, of his household were opened again, and they were able to bear children. And this is where the Lord, I, I've been on this journey, so I'm going to try to share it. I don't want to be overly theological. I'd rather be a little more practical this morning, because I've been on this journey. I've seen some of this blessing. One of the greatest blessings that has come into my life as a pastor and a Christian and the lives of a congregation at Times Square Church is a few years ago when we made a decision to host a pastor's prayer meeting in the city. 
reason but to bless the pastors of New York City and tri-state area. We've had over a thousand pastors now come to these meetings. Uh, there's a core group of 40 to 70 that attend almost all the time, and then there's a, a flow through every month of different uh, pastors. We meet together, we pray together, we worship together, and we have a meal together, then we fellowship together. Um, there are a lot of different distinctives in this meeting. Uh, some people believe in eternal security, some don't, some speak in tongues, some don't. Um, and you know all of the things. I don't have to tell you, you're in, in ministry, you, you understand. And some put prayer shawls on their heads when they pray. Some pray as if they've just run a marathon and they're out of breath, and others pray quietly. And, uh, uh, you know, it's just so, it was very difficult to get through it in the beginning, uh, just to be able to handle the differences, because we, we are all, of, we, we, we all have this frailty, this human frailty, that, that what we do is right and what everybody else does is wrong. And it's in all of us, and we tend to gravitate to practices, and the, the problem of that is that we end up isolating ourselves in the body. And we, we say we love the head. Oh, we love you, Jesus, so much. You know, and we know in Ephesians that we're connected to the head and we are the body. But uh, in a sense, we're, we're, we're trying to love the head and not the body. And it just doesn't work that way. I don't believe you can fully have the head until you've embraced the body. If you don't believe that, for all the men that are here or, or, or just any of the women, go home tonight to your husband or wife and say, Honey, I love your head, but I hate your body. And just see what kind of a relationship you're going to have that night. And so that's, that's, that's exactly what we do to Christ. Oh, we love you, Jesus. But, but I, I just I can't stand your body. I can't stand it. And when we began to pray for our churches as a congregation, sincerely pray for other churches, and it's, it's a practice now in our church. When, when we, we'll have 2,000 people gather for prayer frequently. And when we pray in our services, we say, God, bless the Methodist churches, bless the Baptist churches, Bless the Brethren Churches, bless the Salvation Army, and we, we name the churches in our city, and we say, God, fill them to capacity. We don't, we don't spend all of our time praying for ourselves. We say, fill them to capacity. God, bless the ministers in the pulpits and, and give them a fresh touch from heaven. And there's such a, uh, a stirring happening in the church because this is what Abraham did. He, he, he prayed for another man and, uh, that had unknowingly he felt... He, uh, he, had, he may have felt he had some kind of a, a legitimate grievance against this man, but he, he moved. That's, that was one of the wells that he drank from. He moved beyond this, this, this self-consumption, and he could have just taken his wife and walked away and said, well, all the rest of you die. You deserve to die for what you did and, um, or how you've lived and what you practice, and, and uh, I, don't, I don't agree with what you do. I don't agree with you. Take other people's um, wives as it is, uh, which was the practice then, and... Uh, just because uh, of you desire to, and he, but he prayed for them. And uh, if we don't drink it that well, then we're just allowing the Philistines to put a, a pile of dirt. That's the first truckload. It, it, it takes a while to fill the well of God's life, but that's the first load that the, the enemy will put in that when we become exclusive. And that, that brings a, a, an obvious narrowness to it. We end up a one-spoke bicycle wheel, you know, just probably thematically on one point all the rest of our lives. Preaching one thing, standing, defending that one thing. The church doesn't grow. There's no life. And uh, you're constantly digging in the Bible for some way to prove that one thing that we're holding to, that we say is, is God and everybody else is wrong. And uh, we, we miss the whole point. We, we just miss what God wants to do, and we end up starving ourselves spiritually. Uh, out of this prayer meeting, in Genesis 21, as we, I'm not going to read it through, but as we follow through, it's, it's immediately after this, he prays for Abimelech in Genesis 20, that in Genesis 21, verses 1 to 8, it's, that's where Abraham begins to experience the miraculous power of God. That's where Isaac is born. Now, the Philistines must have been a phenomenal thing when the report goes out that a 100-year-old man has just had a son. I mean, that'd be phenomenal. And they knew this was miraculous. This, this is where God began to release his miraculous power in his life. If you follow the course of Abraham's life in Gerar, because we're talking about that area of the Philistines where these, these wells were dug. And th if you follow sequentially the life of Abraham, you, you'll see exactly what he was spiritually drinking. I know there was, there was physical water, but he was drinking something of, of, of his relationship with God. And now the miraculous power of God begins to flow through him. 
Out of this prayer meeting that we started in New York City, for example, and it was, as I said earlier, it was very, very difficult in the beginning. It's very, very hard to, to find common ground, but we eventually did. We had, to, we had to plow through, we had to press through. And I, I had one man that started coming in the prayer meetings in the, in the beginning, and in my opinion, he couldn't speak normally. He, he was so religious. He just, you know, blessings and peace and much grace and benevolent sanctification to you, my brother. You know, that's the way he would speak all the time. And it was like, goodness sakes, why don't you just say hello? You know, and it was in my heart. And it just wasn't normal. It was just so utterly religious. And as time went on, he, he came every month for, for three, four years. And as time went on, he got more normal. It just, it just happened. I don't know. He just, he just, I'd say, hi, how you doing? You know, I'd say, yeah, great. How you doing? And it just, like, things changed. And, and then I, he got killed. He was killed by a car a few months ago. And I was away in another country, and I didn't know it had happened until I got back. And I still have a grief in my heart because I loved that man. I loved that man. When we, when we started out, we had nothing in common. I went and spoke to his church one time, and uh, I just felt we had, we had absolutely nothing in common but Christ, you see. But then again, we had everything in common because he really loved Jesus Christ. His mannerisms were different. He had a different focus, some few theological things that are really not essential to getting to heaven. Uh, and, but the fellowship that we've established is, is a bloodline fellowship. And I constantly say it, if, you, if you're over the bloodline, if you've trusted Jesus Christ for your salvation, and if you love him, then you are my brother, uh, you're my sister, we are all part of the family of God. We're on this journey together. And like it or not, on the earth, we're going to spend eternity in heaven together. So we, we'd better get used to this now. And, and God is able to break the barriers down. And so out of this prayer meeting that started out just almost as an exercise in a cooperative spirituality, if I can't call it anything but that, out of this prayer meeting came a burden that God gave to us to gather the churches together in uh, New York City in the tri-state area in Times Square and call the city to prayer. Now, that was an impossibility. But you see, when, when Abraham prayed for Abimelech's house, the next thing that happens, the very next thing is the miraculous power of God is released. And we knew this would have to be a miracle. Here, here we are, all these pastors from all these different, the Salvation Army guy's got his uniform on and the, the Jewish guy's got his, his uh, shawl on his head. And we're all different. But the Holy Spirit bore witness, I'm calling you to do this. And so we began to move forward in faith to, to do what really couldn't happen apart from God. And I don't have time to tell you the whole story, but I, I can tell you it was, when, it was miraculous. The very first year, uh, Times Square is considered holy ground in, in, in the United States and particularly New York City. You just simply can't get that real estate. It's, it's just holy ground. And there are seven committees established by the city to smile at you and to thwart every effort to, that you would ever try to get that place for any kind of an event. And that's exactly what, that's, they're, they're, they're put there as dominoes that you, you'll never, hurdles you'll never get over. We, we, we moved forward in faith that first year and we started to call the churches together to prayer and it looked like about 10,000 people were going to come. Phenomenal miracle. One week or so before the event, we, we still didn't have one committee. There are seven committees have to sign off. The first committee, I don't think, had signed off yet. And the second can't sign off till the first signs off. And the third can't sign off till the first and second sign off. And so I remember we were talking, said, what are we going to do? And we said, well, God called us to do this. Let's just do it. Let's just move ahead. We have to trust God. It was how many days, Pastor? You know, five days? The Friday before the Sunday. We got a call from the mayor's office in New York City, and uh, we have something for you. Please send somebody to pick it up. Now, Mayor Bloomberg is a Jewish man in New York City, and we sent somebody down. We had no idea what it was, and when it came back, we opened it up, and lo and behold, there's a proclamation from the mayor of New York City declaring that, that Sunday, prayer in the square day for the city, a declaration from the mayor. This is prayer in the square day. So, of course, the committees just fell over like dominoes, because the mayor had made it. And he's done this for us every subsequent year. And we still don't know why. We don't ask why. We just say, God, this is your hand. This year, there were somewhere, I think a safe estimate is 50,000 people were out this year praying for our city. It was, it was uh, all over the world. If you want to see the event, you can go to NYC as a New York City prayer, nycprayer.org. 
and it's a one hour and 12 minutes, I think, and you'll see the whole event um, in um, New York City. That's where the miraculous, when the body comes together, the miraculous starts to flow. And uh, if, 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 if you and I are not willing to embrace the church of Jesus Christ in all of its forms, then we will be relegated to a smallness most of the, the rest of our lives. But if you're willing to embrace the body of Jesus Christ, the full body of Christ, then the miraculous begins to start because the, in Psalm 126 says, when brethren dwell together in unity, there's an anointing, and he likened it to the oil that's poured down on Aaron's head and flows right to the skirts of his garment. That means an anointing that's all-encompassing. It touches everywhere you go. It goes beyond your borders. When we make the choice to walk together in unity, and I always say, unity is not a feeling, it's a choice. I don't, I don't feel always like being unified, but I choose to be. And that's, Abraham had to choose to pray for Abimelech and his house. He most likely didn't feel like it. Because Abimelech had done an injustice to him, an injustice to his dignity, an injustice to his family and to his wife. And Abraham most likely didn't feel to pray for him, but he chose to pray for him. And when he chose to pray, God turns around and blesses Abraham. In Genesis chapter 21, now after the miraculous begins to happen, he puts away the works and reasonings of the flesh. Now, you know that Abraham had had a son of the flesh, and God says, now this, this son is not going to be a co-inheritor. You've got to put away the works of the flesh. In America today, I, I, say this with a, I say this with a broken heart, but the churches are inundated with works of the flesh, strategies of the natural mind. Strategies to build the kingdom, because the, the church is almost completely cut off, not exclusively, but largely cut off from the supernatural. And it's all natural now. It's all, it's just convention after convention of seven steps to build a big church. They don't even have a clue what a, of what a good church is. Everybody thinks that if your church gets to 10,000, wow, you're a success. No, sir. I wish I had time to share with you today that what the real role model of success is. Let me tell you in a, in a nutshell. Jesus Christ died for every soul that's under your care. I don't care if you have 21 people in your church. He died for those people. And when you get to heaven, that's what you will answer for. You'll answer for every one of those people that he would have died, even if they were the only one that he would have come for. And the measure of success is not that you had a church of 5,000 people. is that you got to heaven those people that God put under your care. Praise be to God. That's why everything's going to be reversed when we get there. Many who are last are going to be first. And many who are first are going to be last when we get to heaven. We put away the works and the reasonings of the flesh. We are able and able to go back into the prayer closet and begin to seek God again and begin to ask him to do what only God can do. Again in Genesis, Genesis 21, verses 25 to 32, he made peace with men who had violently wronged him. The herdmen of, uh, of that particular king had taken away something that was rightfully his. And Abraham made peace with them. It's important to make peace as, as much as you can with every man, every woman, everybody, in the, especially in the body of Christ. As much as is possible, walk peaceably, the scripture says, with all men. Make peace. Make peace. And put away the grievances. Jesus himself said it this way. A man was forgiven a great debt. And then he went to another man who owed him a whole lot less than he owed the man who forgave him. And he took him by the throat, and he wouldn't forgive him, and said, pay me what you owe. And the end result of that is he's delivered to a tormenting spirit. And I, I, I want to, I have to believe, like Jesus warned strongly about the danger of unforgiveness. It's a root. It, it can produce a bitter ministry. It can, it can be the root that makes us feel exclusive or more important than others. It can bring us out of humility where the true power of God is and lead us into an incredible spiritual pride. It's important to make peace. I've done everything in my power that I know to be at peace with every man that I have ever wronged or has ever wronged me. Those that I've wronged, I've called and asked for forgiveness. Those that have wronged me, I've called them and asked for forgiveness. And is it possible we can reconcile? In most cases, reconciliation has come. There are always a few that somebody just chooses to hold to a position of unforgiveness, but yet I am not willing to hold unforgiveness in my heart. And as a minister, you must be very careful of this. It'll destroy you. It'll destroy your ministry. It'll take away the, the anointing of God. Your vision will leave. And you'll end up tormented in your mind. You'll end up 
struggling. And there's an opening gets into your spirit to the, workers, the works of darkness if you have unforgiveness. Abraham drank from this well of forgiveness, drank from this well of taking the lowest seat in the house as it is and refusing to create a list of wrongs in his heart and said, I'm going to take the higher road. If, if Christ could forgive me, if, if Christ could overlook my transgressions, if Christ could go to a cross for us in all of, the, in all of the, our fail, frailties and failings and the things that we've done wrong, then surely in the power of God I can forgive any man who has wronged me. It's, 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 it's Bible 101. But it's strange that a lot of people choose to go another way even though that we have the knowledge of this truth. And then in Genesis chapter 22, he was willing to give up all that was dear to him if God required it. And you know, you know the story. The Lord told him, take your son Isaac and sacrifice him. And he was willing to give up. And you and I have to be willing to give up our reputation. We have to be willing to give up our aspirations of greatness and success and everything else that we think the gospel is supposed to bring to us. We have to be willing to become servants to the body of Jesus Christ, to take the lowest seat in the house, to, to, to give away, to give up. The ministry is not yours. The ministry is not mine. I, I do not, I pastor Times Square Church, I do not own the ministry. It is not mine. It is God's. He's given it to me for a season. I remember one time I was praying, and this may sound trite to you, but this is the way the Lord answered me. And I said, God, what is, what is my role in Times Square Church? What do you want me to do with the church? You know, you'd expect in your mind, oh, I want you to sweep the world and bring in my kingdom. You know, that's, that's typically what we want to hear. The Lord told me, don't spill the peas. And I, I, was, I thought it was a strange response. And then suddenly I, felt, I saw myself sitting at a Thanksgiving table. And you know when somebody just says, pass the peas? And, and just, you're just careful, you get them, and you just get them to the next guy. And he said, just don't spill the peas. Just, you get, the way you get it, you hand it to the next guy. That's your job. Don't spill the peace. And I finally understood, oh God, I'm just here for a moment. This is put into my hands by grace and it's, it's leaving my hands shortly. It, it's not mine. I'm only an invited guest here. It, it, it belongs to the host of the house. It's not mine. It belongs to God. It's in my hands for a short season. It's passed to the next guy. And uh, I'm just, I, I, I just want to get to the throne of grace one day and say, God, I didn't spill the peas. I mean, you put it in my hand, I didn't spill it. I passed it on. As, as, as warm as I received it, as, as, as uh, intact as, as I received it, I gave it to the next person. And in, in, in this place of being willing to give up all that was dear to him, he found God as Jehovah Jireh. He found God as his provision. He actually found the provision of Christ. He found life. It, it's, so, it's so joyful to let go of everything. Now, we don't let go of it to the point where we're careless about it, but we let go that it's not our identity anymore. I, I don't have an identity because I preach. My identity is not in the fact that I pastored a big church. That's terrific. And, and God has been gr very gracious to me and sent me a lot of places throughout the world to preach, but my identity is not in that. If, if my voice was lost tomorrow, if my health is gone, I, I'm as whole and entire as I've always been. Nothing has changed. My identity is in Christ. I, I am who I am because of Jesus Christ. It's not because of ministry. Don't let ministry become your identity. Your identity is Christ. If ministry becomes your identity, um, it's, it's, a, it's a downward spiral all the way. You, you, you become defensive and offensive and don't go there. It's not your identity. Christ is your identity. If I lost my health tomorrow, somebody asked me, they said, if you lost your health, what would you do? And that is a real issue because I do deal with some strong health issues. Well, I said, I, I just find a church somewhere that has a, a heart for the poor. And I would start taking out groceries to poor families and sitting down with them and telling them about the goodness of God. As much as I could squeak it out, I would tell them. Nothing would change. Absolutely nothing would change because my identity has never been in ministry. I didn't want to go into ministry. I fought against God. I didn't want to preach. I loved what I was doing. It was a long-standing battle to leave what I was doing to go into the ministry. My identity has never been in ministry. It's in Christ. I thank God for that with all my heart. Now Isaac begins to dig the wells again in Genesis 26 where we started in verse 18. And in verse uh, 19, it's, I'm going to show you how these wells get filled up by the powers of darkness again. In just another, I'm going to go about five more minutes. 
It says, And Isaac's servants digged a well in the valley, in verse 19, and found there a well of springing water. And the herdmen of Gerar did strive with Isaac's herdmen, saying, The water is ours. And he called the name of the well Esek, because they strove her. That means, Esek means contention. And they digged another well and strove for that also. And he called the name of it Sitna. And he removed from thence and digged another well, and they strove not. And he called the name of it Rehoboth, which means room. And he said, For now the Lord has made room for us, and we shall be fruitful in the land. The only material that the Philistines need to fill and stop the supply which God has given you in Christ is strife and contention. That's all they need. If the devil can get you striving, if the devil can get you into contention, that's all he needs to fill your well. That's it. Then you're just as weak as any other man. He takes away that separation to God, just like Delilah did in the life of Samson. Cuts away that separation that makes you different from other men in the, and women in the earth. Takes it away from you and then fills that well. And now you're just a person with a lot of religious knowledge. You, you know the Bible, you can quote the Bible, even do a bit of good. But you really, really are cut off from the supernatural. That part of the life of God that makes ordinary men extraordinary. Makes natural men supernatural takes us into places we could never hope to go, makes us what we could never hope to be. If you're a contentious man, I promise you, you're going little or no places in the kingdom of God. And that's just the reality of it. I say that with a very loving heart. Paul said, I fed you with milk and not with meat to the Corinthians. For up to this point, you were not able to bear it, and neither now are you able, for you're yet carnal. For whereas there is among you envying and strife and division, are you not carnal and walk as men? In other words, are you not living and drawing from the old nature? Is not the earth beginning to fill your well? Paul said, I wanted to give you meat, but you can't hear it. You can't bear it because you're still full of division. You're still striving. You're still fighting among each other. And he said, because of it, you can't hear. It doesn't really get any simpler than that. This is the inspired text of God by the Holy Spirit. That you can't hear because there's division, because there's striving, because one says, I'm of Paul. No, I'm of Apollos. No, I'm of Peter. I'm of Christ. And in this body, there's this division. And it, it, can, it can appear to be a good thing, can be, appear to be a holy thing. This is just sort of my, my preference. But the inference is I have no use for these other ones because this is my man. This is my type of preaching. This is my type of gospel. And it's falling into that trap of the eye saying to the hand, I have no need of you. One part of the body saying to the other part, you, you're not necessary in my life. I don't need you. I think one of the greatest revelations that God's ever given to me is that I need every person in the body of Jesus Christ. I, I, you are as essential to my life as a Christian as any other thing that God has ever given to me. James chapter 3 and verse 16 says, where there's envy and strife, there's confusion and evil work. Now think of that, where there's envy and strife. And we may consider ourselves the most anointed people on the face of the planet. But God looks down and says, no, I see confusion. I see an evil work. I see a work that's supposed to bring my life into a town. And all it's done is close its doors and exclude the lost. I don't see my heart there. I don't see my life there. I don't see my work there. There's no vision there. I can't speak there. I want to give you revelation, but I can't because of the contention, because of the division. You see, division is just a trap. It's a frailty of the human heart, and it's a trap of the devil. And the sooner we realize it, the better off we're going to be. I've made a choice not to walk in division. And I believe that God has opened to us the supernatural. He really has. We, we've seen things that only God could do. We, we've been in places that only God could take us. And so instead of staying there, they, they started out and they dug a well and that became contended over and they dug another one and that, that one became a, a place of strife. And verse 22 says they removed from there and they, they dug another well. And they didn't strive for that when they called it room or Rehobo. There's room for all of us now. And it said, for, from now the Lord has made room for us in verse 22, and we shall be fruitful in the land. There's room for all of us. Praise God. That shouldn't be a revelation, but I guess it is. There's room for all of us. There's room for all of us. Praise God. There's room for the brethren. There's room for the Pentecostals, the Charismatics. There's room for the, you know, I mean, I understand that there are some doctrines we have to, we, we, we do have to, you know, we have to take an issue with sometimes. But there's room. If, if we're over the bloodline, that's really the issue. Are we over the bloodline? Are we part of the family of God? And if, that, if we can definitively say yes to that, then there's room for all of us. Praise God. I thank God for that. 
I, I thank God for that with all of my heart. One of the greatest compliments that we've ever been paid as a church in New York City, Times Square Church, is now we're, we're typically Assemblies of God theologically, but one of the greatest compliments we've ever been paid is every pastor who comes in from anywhere in the world said, I, I feel this is every man's church. I feel welcome here. I don't feel condemned here. I, I, I feel that, yes, I, I realize that we, we have some different approaches, but you don't condemn me for my approach. And that's been a constant, because I don't, we don't condemn anybody else for their approach. We, we don't dogmatically stand up and say, you heard me last night, for example, get the Holy Spirit. I don't care how you do that. I don't care what your perspective is. The Holy Spirit is the third person of God given to the church for the empowerment of the work of God. And I don't care what your perspective is on that. Just get the Holy Spirit. And just, just keep seeking until you know that the Holy Spirit has gripped your life. And so I don't have to go into dogmatic things that this has to happen and this has to happen and start arguing with people. To, of when did you get the Holy Spirit? How do you get the Holy Spirit? Just get the Holy Spirit. It's like arguing over how we travel to a store to buy a new pair of shoes. Someone guy says, no, you take the bus. No, you walk, because my uncle walked every time he went to get a pair of shoes. And somebody else says, no, you gotta, you gotta go around the block three times. And, and it's just all, just get the shoes. I don't care how you get there, just get there. And in John chapter four, Jesus gave us the ultimate example when he went into Samaria and he sat down on the well of those who at least culturally should have been considered inferior and enemies. They were the Samaritans. They were, in the eyes of the Jew, they were a mixture. It's a long history. I don't have a chance to get into it all, but they were a mixed people and they were, they were not considered pure. Theologically, they did worship God, but theologically, according to the Jew, they were a little outside of the the true realm of what worship should be. And so they said, well, we don't talk to these people. It was just common knowledge. The Jew does not talk to the Samaritan. And so Jesus sends his disciples into town to get food. He had to really get rid of them to do his work at that point. And he sits down on a well of somebody who's considered inferior, mixed. And on top of that, it's a woman that the disciples do not think he should be talking to. And he offers a truce. It's amazing when you consider it. He says, you, you give me a drink of water and I'll give you water. Now, I want you to really just think through the simplicity of this situation. He asks her, he has a need and he asks her to meet the need and he says, no, but I'm willing to meet your need. And he, he makes a truce with these people who would be considered really enemies actually to the people of Israel. When the disciples came back, the scripture says they marveled that he talked with this woman. They marveled. They marveled. It was an astounding thing to them. 